And a good day to you, wherever you may be. And thank you again for joining me for some time together in the Word. Before we go into the Word this day, let's go up to the throne of grace and seek God's blessing and His help upon our time together. Father, we are before your throne and thankful that it is just that, a throne of grace. You have told the believer it's a place where he or she may come in time of need to find help that will be graciously given. And at this hour, Father, there certainly is a need of help from my perspective. It is the help of the Holy Spirit to choose to use me, Lord, by your grace and your tender mercies that he might speak the word of truth from the scriptures today. So I ask that the spirit might be the speaker, the instrument Heavenly Father might not be in the way. Thank you, Father, for your word, for the living word. Father, and thank you for the person of the word. The word became flesh. Father, more than the mind can really grasp that God the Son became a human being, walked among us, lived among us. And Father left us an example of what a relationship with you should be like and what a life lived to your glory should be like. And then he did this. He left us his very mind in the form of the written word. And it's that mind we opened this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever we are, to seek that the Spirit of God might show us wondrous things from thy word. That, Father, we might be conformed as a result of our time in the word today, maybe just a little bit more, to the image of the word, the living word, the person of Jesus, our Savior, whose name we thank you. Amen. The people I have here, as you can see, I put a name, Jay Austin and Lauren Gohagen, and I'm not 100% sure about pronunciation of Lauren's name, but I hope it's halfway close. Uh, there are a couple of, uh, of young people. Uh, I call them, well, they are young to me. They were 29-year-old kids. I have grandchildren older than that, so I, that's why I can call them kids. But th they had worked hard after they got out of school. They both went to George, Wa uh, George Washington, I believe, or Georgetown, Georgetown University, uh, and graduated from Georgetown and, and went into the work world. Uh, Jay went to work for the government, and Lauren ultimately went back uh, to or at work at the university in, in admissions. But they had worked about seven, eight years and out of school and decided, you know, they had saved their money, were responsible, and they wanted to do something. They wanted to take a bicycle trip around the world. And so they're going to do it while they were young. And that's exactly what they did. They quit their jobs, and away they went around the world with another couple uh, taking a bicycle trip. Uh, they started off in Africa, and there's a picture of them in Botswana, and went across part of the African continent. Here they are in e Egypt, uh, with pictures of pyramids. And I believe after their time in Africa, they got bicycles were packed up, and they flew to the European continent, and I'm not sure where they are at, at this point. Uh, but you can see a completely different scenery than Africa. As uh, Jay's bicycling, I don't see Lauren in the picture, probably ahead of him, leading him on. Uh, but, but they were traveling uh, through Europe and continued on through Europe and came to uh, entering into what I, was, I used to call uh, part of Asia Minor. I guess today they call it Central Asia, uh, but they're here at the border in Central Asia, uh, getting ready to go into Pakistan. Uh, that's where they were ready uh, to head. Now, Lauren's uh, parents, and I'm sorry I've got part of her face blocked with mine. Hers is, she's a much more attractive young lady than me. Let me get me out of the way. But Lauren's mother had this to told this to CBS News about her daughter and the trip. 
she said that the year-long bicycle adventure Lauren and her partner Jay Austin were enjoying was typical of her enthusiasm, embrace of life's opportunities, her openness to new people and places, and her quest for a better understanding of the world. Jay's mother, uh, and I don't have her mother's name in my head any longer, it's been a while since I did this, Santavosa, I believe, her last name is Santavosa. Uh, she told the Washington Post this about her son. This is, he was in Spain at this point. Said he was a gentle soul who cared about the world and not leaving any footprint and leaving it a better place. Well, I don't like to mention places without telling you where they were. I do a Bible study and, and even in geography. I did not really know where Taka, uh, Taji, ta I can't even get the word out of my mouth. <laughs> it's a forgiving point. Sean just, Takistan was, uh, but uh, so I got a map. I figured it was someplace in this given area, you know, Pakistan, Afghanistan, so uh, Ubakistan. So I wasn't surprised that Pakistan was here uh, in this part of the world. These young people were told, sorry, before they got to this point not to go there. This was a very dangerous part of the world and they were strongly urged not to. But Jay decided, no, they were going to press on uh, forward. Uh, and did, he said he really wasn't unduly concerned about it. Uh, but he should have been. Because this deadly attack on foreign cyclists on July 29th was reference to an attack, at least ISIS claimed, to be uh, the perpetrators of this horrific stabbing, slaughtering of two nice young American kids. Both Lauren, <coughs> excuse me, both Lauren and Jay were stabbed more than 17 times and died. The other couple were able to escape. Uh, what happened is that they, they knocked, they, uh, people from ISIS, first knocked them down with a vehicle uh, off their bikes, and these guys came pouring out of a hidden area, stabbed the two of them while the other two were able to escape. Uh, now, I tell you all this information first, and it just breaks my heart that this happened. Uh, and you wonder why didn't the kids follow the counsel of the people that were warning them? Even the, the Pakistanis at the border told them you should not be going into this country. You can, but we strongly urge you don't. Well, the reason was because Jay believed that evil was a make believe concept. Uh, I've got a picture up there. I, I hope people can see that evil's not a make-believe concept. It's a reality. But here's what this young man wrote, and this is while they were in Africa on this trip. Jay wrote, you watch the news and you read the papers and you're led to believe the world is a big, scary place. People, the narrative goes, are not to be trusted. People are bad. People are evil. People are axe murderers and monsters and worse. I don't buy it. Evil is a make-believe concept we've invented to deal with the complexities of fellow humans holding values and beliefs and perspectives different than our own, it's easier to dismiss an opinion as abhorrent than strive to understand it. I can't live long enough to understand the beheading of people for having a different religious view than you have. No, I will never understand it. It's evil. But Jay did not see evil as existing. Badness exists, sure, but even that's quite rare. 
by and large, humans are kind, self-interested sometimes, myopic sometimes, but kind, generous, and wonderful in kind. No greater revelation has come from our journey than this. I, see, I find it so hard to understand how a bright, intelligent young man, in light of the overwhelming news, then we are, uh, to me, I'm overwhelmed with information in this information age. How can you not see from television, hear from radio, uh, from podcast on the internet, from social me media? How can you not realize that evil exists? Uh, I would tell you that by and large, yeah. Most of the people I've met in life, I have found to be, relatively speaking, relatively speaking, outwardly nice, decent, kind people. But to think that evil is a make-believe concept, like I said, it's just almost impossible for me to grasp, even apart from the Word of God, which I now have sitting in front of you with two passages I'm about to read. If Jay had had this perspective, Maybe he and Lauren would be alive. I, I don't know. But here's what the scripture tells me. I don't need the television. I don't need uh, the radio station. I don't need, I'm trying to reach for a clock so I can watch my time. I don't need uh, social media. I don't need all of these things to tell me that evil exists and that there's evil in the world, Romans 7.20 says, Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul's acknowledging that there's something in him that lives in him that causes at times for him to do things that he does not want to do, even things that he calls evil. And that thing that dwells in him is this ugly creature. I built had this character of the thing that we call the old man, sometimes the scripture, sometimes the scripture calls uh, this aspect of our immaterial being, the flesh, and sometimes the sin nature that dwells in every human being. And at verse 23, Paul says, but I see another law, it's a working principle in my members, that is within his body, warring against the law of his mind, bringing me into captivity to the law, that is to the principle, the, 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 just like we talk about the law of gravity, every time something comes up, it comes down, it, it's just a law, it, it's, it's a principle that's factual, it brings me into captivity to that kind of factual law or principle of sin, which literally is taste, harmartias. You can see that I have two words, this is taste, harmartias, and this is the sin, and the word sin is a noun. So it's a person, place, or thing, and I call it the sin nature, this, the old man or the flesh which is in my members. This is what the Apostle Paul is referring to. So to, to, to think that evil doesn't exist that's make-believe, okay? But to think that evil isn't a reality, that's pure fantasy. I mean, the scriptures dogmatically declare that the sin nature dwells. The sin nature dwells in each human being. This ugly, horrible, dark, what we talk about, everybody has, you know, the, the, 
but this dark place and it's a sin nature it's this this evil dwells in each human being and there are spiritual consequences of living in denial of the reality of the existence of our sin nature there are there are at least two simply simple put ones if we live in denial of the sin nature then we are living in deception and i can see that some of the changes i made are not going to take i had some problems right before i opened this up and went to an older version so we'll just have to work the older version deception what that that deception if we deny there's a sin nature then one of the consequences is we're going to be living in deception and the other is death now, i'm not talking about in this case physical death but spiritual we're talking about separation from god these are two of the consequences of living in denial to this ugly sin nature within us and this is why we find the command in first corinthians the one i'm looking at there are others in first corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9 that tells us to be not or do not be deceived do not deceive yourselves or more literally be not do not be deceived stop deceiving yourselves the passage reads know ye not that the unrighteous who in the context refers to the unbeliever the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived stop being deceived or stop deceiving yourself sorry to turn away from you i still get my clock stop deceiving yourselves first corinthians chapter six at verse nine now this passage the word be not deceived is a translation of two greek words may play an ostay may play an ostay we have may is a negative particle it's a little word looks like me me plus the verb play an ostay is in a present tense imperative mood form that's what this verb form is and the normal rule is not always but most of the time when you see the greek negative particle may and you see a verb in a present tense imperative mood like this verb is then normally that means to stop doing something that you are doing quit deceiving yourselves that is the command that we have been looking at now this becomes i believe the fifth clock session and <clears throat> right now we are looking at the things that believers are to do to know or to be aware of in order to be able to protect themselves against the deception of sin and particularly specifically against the deception of the sin nature that then leads us in to sin these are things we need to either do know or be aware of or all three at the same time if we're going to protect ourselves from the deception of the sin nature and today we are ready to look at the sixth of the several things that i've been able to identify from god's word that tell us we need in this case do this is a do thing something we need to do in order to protect ourselves <clears throat> from the deception of the sin nature put on the new man that is the new creation in you who is created in the image of christ we are commanded to put on this new man ephesians 4 23 24 colossians 3 10 i'm going to look at the romans passage we looked at part of it last week in second corinthians 5 17 or a, a couple two or three of the passages that bring to light the reality of the truth for believers to put on the new man we read this in romans 13 11. i'm going to back up a little bit so i have the context before i get to the 14th verse 
excuse me, we read, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of a sleep, out of sleep. For now is the salvation nearer than when we believed. I would just like to comment on the, the statement he says here, now knowing the time, the words knowing the time I am. Ida Tess Tan Chiron, it really means knowing the season. It's not so much that you're looking at, well, see the time right now on, on my clock happens to be almost 20 minutes of two. That, that's not the sense. He's not pointing to a, an, a, an hour, minute, or even a, a month, day type of timing. He's talking about a season. See, right now, some of you, we're not quite in Arizona. It's the beginning of the fall season. Seas, that's a period of time. We've entered into a season that we call fall. We arbitrarily pick a date, uh, about September 20th, was it 20th or 21st this year? And then it's going to end, you know, sometime around 20th, 21st of December. That's a season or sports fans that are happy campers now because football season has began. So what he's saying is that we're now in the season, that's the point. We are in the season of something. In the season that we're in is the season for the time that we need to wake up. It's high time because we're in a season. Uh, in fact, we've been in a season for some time, so we'll see. It. But let me move forward. Just know that we're looking in, that we're in a season. Okay, the season that we're in, look, the night is far spent. So we're in a season in which the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, some things to do, cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. When Paul writes the night is far spent, just very simply, that little phrase denotes the time when the Lord Jesus is not physically, personally, bodily form present on earth. And the current world system, which is under Satan's control, continues to keep people in darkness, blinding into the glorious truth of the light of the gospel and keeping them separated from God. So, the night is far spent, this era of Christ not being personally uh, with us in bodily presence, this era, uh, era uh, season of the world system being under the dominating control, the influence of Satan and his season of being able to continue to work to keep human beings and blindness concerning the truth of the gospel, the love and the grace and the mercy of God. See, that season, he said, is far spent. That season, if you will, is almost gone or is nearly over. These are the three ways that the Greek word Porcopto is translated. So I'm not sure. I don't force people into any one text because I don't know you. I don't do it in my own church. So I don't know which Bibles some of you might be trying to follow me in. I look at five translations and then try and put up what each of those translations say. The ones I look at, New American Standard, New King James, the English Standard Version, the International Version, and... Uh, the New Revised Standard Version, in addition to my King James. So I'm looking at those five, and th these are the translations I found for, for Copto in those five translations. So when he says that the time is far spent, or far gone, or almost gone, nearly over, for Copto means this, and this is just straight from a lexicon, to move, move forward 
to a final stage. So we are in the final stage of the season in which Jesus is not personally present in bodily form on earth. We're into the final stage of the season in which Satan has the dominating control over this world system, keeping men in darkness concerning spiritual truth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he means. That's what these words mean. That's porcopto. Here is a, a use of the word, and this is just coming from something that's called the first apology and the second apology by Justin Martyr. It's a dialogue with Trifo, or is it Philo? Philo. Okay, here's, here's what it reads. I just want to give you just a little taste for this word that we're, that's used in this context. The word back up one, porcopto, and here's porcopto. It says, Moses, that faithful and blessed servant of God, tells us that he who appeared to Abraham under the oak tree of Mamre was God, sent with two accompanying angels to judge Sodom by another. Whoever abides in the super celestial sphere, who has never been seen by any man, and with whom no man has ever conversed, and whom we call creator of all and father here are the words of moses and god appeared to him under the oak in mamre as he was sitting at the door of his tent in the porcopto in the very heat of the day in the final stage of the hottest time of the day. See, the Porcopto in Arizona, we won't, it won't be till about four o'clock in the afternoon. You wanna to get to the final stage of the hottest time of the day, that's four o'clock in Arizona. That's Porcopto. And that's how we should understand the word in Romans chapter 13 and verse 11. And here's what Josephus does with Procopto. Gives you another place to see this word. Get a good feel for it. For truly, as the night was Procopto, was far gone, and the storm very terrible, Annas gave the guards and cloisters leave to go to sleep. Now, while I came into the heads of the zealots to make use of the saws belonging to the temple and to cut the bars of the gates to pieces. I just want you to get a good sense of that to where we are. You and I, right now, we are in the final stages of the personal, literal, physical absence of Jesus Christ from planet Earth. We are in the final stages of the season of darkness of Satan having ruling control over the world system in his blinding work to keep men away from the truth of the gospel. So now that he restates this uh, kind of in a positive sense, the night is far spent, but the day in contrast is at hand. I don't think I put this up, so let me do it from my head. I don't remember making the slide for this. Is at hand is the word ignizo. Ignizo is a perfect tense verb. And that's the important thing I want you brought, brought out here. The night is far spent. Hopefully we'll have a feel for that. The day is at hand perfect tense, meaning that, from, that the time Paul was pinning this. At that given time, the day had already arrived. It was there, okay? Right then, and being a perfect tense, it continues to be at hand. The stress of the perfect tense here in the Greek is to place the emphasis upon the abiding results of the action. So it is at hand, as Paul wrote, and it continues even today to be at hand, which this tells me that from the Apostle Paul, under, as he understood the Old Testament scriptures 
And as he had been enlightened by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul believed at the time for Jesus' literal physical return was imminent. And that's the whole point. It's, it could happen right now, Paul's saying. And since it's perfect tense, it could have it happen pretty much any time from the point in time when Paul was pinning uh, this letter to the believers at Rome. So you and I are living at a time, at that, at that time, at that point in place. So, therefore, in light of the fact that we're in the final stages, the, 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 the final end, and the return of Christ is imminent, let us, therefore, cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Oh, I did have Ignizio. Sorry. Well, that's the, what the verb I was just expressing. Is at hand, Ignizio, that perfect tense form of the verb, is at hand, remains at hand. So Paul believed and he taught that the Lord could return at any time, and that's where we're at. And we're in the final stages of that. That's what he says when he writes. So, therefore, cast off the works of darkness. Well, the works of darkness is a metaphorical phrase that's used to express works that are characteristic of the present age, in which people walk according to Satan, the prince of the power of the air in the world system, which is under his control. Now, here, some, I'm around the business world. You want to know what's characteristics in the business world today? One of the characteristics of the business world is make all the money you can, you know, I can't, I don't want to put that kind of phraseology, make all the money you can. I don't care who you have to crush to get it. You want to squeeze every dime you can, you know, Heck with your employees, walks, trample on them, get rid of them, get new ones. That's characteristic of today's business age. And it stinks. It's awful. It's awful, but yet that's the way it is. It's all about greed. There you go. There's, I could have put in a simple word. Characteristic of the age, there's one, greed. Another one, closely related, selfishness. These are characteristics of the age. We're to put those kind of characteristics off and all the characteristics of the age that are contrary to the correct, clear teaching of the scriptures. This is what he's talking about. Works that are characteristics of the present age in which people, most of them do it blindly, don't have a clue, are walking according to Satan, an age of pride, the prince of the power of the air and the world system, which is under his present control that promotes godlessness and conduct which is contrary and hostile to god's word it doesn't take but a second of looking around and what you see all kinds of conduct contrary to god's word we drunkenness is alcohol abuse rampant in our country drug abuse rampant in our country sexual immorality rampant in our country this is a part of the things that are make up this sphere they cause cast off the works of darkness, hostile to God's word, and include things like verse 13. So let me put it back in one whole sentence. Works that are characteristic of the present age in which people walk according to Satan, the prince of the power of the air and the world system, which under his, under his control in this present age promotes godless conduct, which is contrary and hostile to God's word, and includes things like those in verse 13. Now, that we're put that off, and then we're put on the whole armor of God. Now, the whole armor of God, really it's plural, the armors, literally. But since he used the singular, the whole armor, uh, I believe what he had in mind is what I now have in a picture form. I mean, the, the word hoopla literally means tools. It means instruments or weapons. But because he uses a plural, uh, I think he's looking at this picture he has in mind. The believer is a soldier. And he's, in his mind looks at the whole armor of the Roman soldier, which, as you could see, he had a helmet. 
And that's in Ephesians, I'm not going through this, called the helmet of salvation. So we're to have pulled together the reality of the truth of the salvation of Jesus Christ. That truth is to be locked into the heart, mind, soul, mentality of the inner man, firmly understood, okay? And then the breastplate of righteousness, not ours. He's talking about one who has to be clothed in the righteousness of God. And, and then we have the shield of faith. Oh, that's how we protect ourselves. It's one of our protection methods. Uh, the belt of truth, which I think is an inf <coughs> speak, speaks to the, boy, I'm losing my voice already. Truth to the word of God. And you can kind of see it out of one details in this, but this belt that it refers to, this armor is held together. This is the breastplate and all these things. His, his uh, sword, this is all held together by this belt. It's the truth of the word of God that pulls everything together for us. And then we have the spirit. This is our only, notice, this is his only offensive weapons, his sword, which is the word of God. And then his feet are to be, boy, and I love this, shod with the gospel, piece of the gospel. If I had, doing this real detail, I would show you on the bottom of those soles or, or nails or some kind of studs. Uh, they were made to give, to do one thing, to give the soldier stability as he was in battle or, or in travel. They were keeping stable, and it's a true understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our stability. But this is what we're to put on, the whole armor of God. This made C.K. Barrett say, and I thought it was something worth passing on to you as I was reading what others did with these passages when I was done. He said, when a man embarks upon the Christian life, he enters a career of conflict. And boy, indeed, we should expect that. We should expect to be in battle. We should not expect, you see, sometimes I do, and then I frustrate myself because I realize after the fact, Dumb, you're in a battle. Why do you think you're going to have an easy Saturday? I could go through the day with you. It's just awful. Most of my Saturdays are awful anymore. But I've got to remember, and this is what I'm recording most of the time Saturday, I'm engaged in a battle. It's not going to be easy. And pray for me that I can do a better job of utilizing the tools that God has given to me in the means of grace and those tools of armor. You need them too. Because we're in a conflict, and it's going to be a lifelong one, or one until the Lord returns. And so therefore, let us walk, now here's some, again some different translations, honestly, behave, or walk properly, live honorably, behave decently, as in the day, but not in the night, uh, re reveling in drunkenness, uh, and not in immorality, and wantonness, not in strife and envyings, and I've got to kind of move along. The word translated either honestly, properly, honorably, or decently, depending on your Bible. Uske manos. Uske manos is a compound word, not used much in the New Testament. Here, I think. It's u, which means, can you keep this part in mind, that which is beneficial? It, it's going to be beneficial for something. It's going to be good for something. The contact, the conduct, is going to be good for something. And in schema, that's the second part of this uske manos, schema is the second part. And I bet you can almost hear an English word with a schematic. Well, a schema is used to denote that which has shape, that which has form, uh, and that which is outwardly can be seen, visible. That's its literal sense. So, and here's a couple of quick lexical definitions of schema. Generally, recognize state or form in which something appears. Uh, see, the schema of my little pop-up is somewhat round. You can, hopefully you can see that. See, it's, it's, that's its schema. It's outward form. These are things I hold notes in. So the generally recognized state or form in which something appears, outward appearance, form, shape, 
that's the first definition now here's this second now this becomes important it has a literal sense now to a figurative sense the functional aspect of something way of life way of things so it doesn't it's not always used literally for an outward schema you could use it for my body you could say his schema is small he has a he is small schema, small frame, my outward form, but it also has figurative sense, okay? And, and the figurative sense goes beyond just looking at the outward form. That's, just keep that in text mind for a bit. So let us walk honestly, behave, walk properly, live honorably, behave decently, and I'll try and elaborate that just a bit more, as in the day, not in reveling, in drunkenness. I'm, rev, the other words don't need anything. Let me just touch reveling real quickly. Reveling is the word komas. Komas means reveling, revelry, carousing, orgies, depending on which Bible again you use. Those are the translations I found. Here, Plutarch gives us, a, it, Plutarch lives. Here's a good example of the words used in a broader context outside the New Testament. And I think pretty quickly we get a hint. It, we read it in this part from Plutarch. It says, after this, as he, he's talking about Alexander the Great, was about to march forth against Darius, it chanced that he consented to take part in a merry drinking bout of his companions at which women also came to meet their lovers and shared in their wine and revelry. I don't think anybody has any difficulty understanding that was a wild bash, big party, booze, drinking, sex, women, men, revelry. So that's the kind of the sense of the word. Here's how Thayer's lexicon defines that word. A revel, carousal, a nocturnal and riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who after supper parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity and sing and play before the houses of their male and female friends. See, when, he, when I was reading this, my mind's think of a bunch of guys in a, in a fraternity at college after their football team won the big game and they're all out of the bar sloshing them down one after the other and going through the streets yeah 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 raw 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 just boom bah. that's the sense okay hence generally use the feast and drinking parties that are protracted till late at night in indulgent revelry so i hope that gives you a sense for the word uh the word drunkenness other than to tell you it's plural you don't need me to explain anything more to you than that. Let us not, let us walk honestly as in the days, not in revelings, wild, extreme, extreme, lavagant, indulgence in all kinds of drinking and sexual uh, uh, adventure and drunkennesses. Not in immorality or sexual immorality, lewdness, Sexual promiscuity, again, depending on your Bible, how they translate coites, which means wantonness, sensuality, and I'd probably use debauchery in this passage. Lust, asilegias, that's the word, it's a plural. So just debaucheries, strife, dissension, quarreling, and envying, envying, jealousy, need no explanation. And that's how that verse winds up at verse 13. Go back to asilegia for a minute. It is behavior completely lacking in any moral restraint, usually with the implication of sexual licentiousness or licentious behavior, extreme immorality pertaining to promiscuous sexual behavior is how Lowe and Knight, his Greek English lexicon of the New Testament uh, defines the word in this, <coughs> as it's used in this context. So, <coughs> Excuse me. 
in commenting on these two verses, and I thought he did a great job, so I'm just going to use it for a second because I went through some things pretty rapidly. But as you think about what we've just read and looked at, Wilmington's Bible Handbook said this to believers. It's time for believers to wake up. It's time for believers to shake up or shape up. And it's time for believers to look up. Okay, and, and, and look, this, look at these words. Look how they fit in the verses. Let me just some stuff with the verse. Verse 11 said what? Awake. So it's time to wake up. And verse 12 said the night is far spent. Hopefully we understand that the, the, the time of the absence of the physical presence of Jesus Christ bodily and Satan's having control over this world system, that's coming. It's, it's right at the end. What, what does that mean? Well, the Lord's going to return, so wake up, look up. And then put off the works of darkness, shape up. So in a nutshell, that's what Romans 11, uh, Romans 13, 11, and 12 are saying. And I think he did a great job, so thank you, Harold. Nice job. Now, I said, I'd go back to, to what's he talking about? You walk honestly or let your behavior be decent. Let me summarize it this way. Let us walk in a manner that's be, befitting, and I probably should stretch this out a little bit different. Let's, be, let's walk in a manner that's befitting a believer. What's that manner, Carl? Walk in a manner that is consistent with your position in Christ. That's what he's talking about. Let us walk or live our life in a manner that is consistent with our position in Christ. And so how do we do that? Well, by putting on the new man the new creation in you who's created in the image of Jesus Christ. That is how we do that. See, putting off the old man, that's not going to be enough. We put him off, and then we have to put on the new man that's in the image of Christ. Now, I use this diagram uh, to try and visualize what the immaterial nature of Jesus, his humanity, what that was like. And his humanity was a perfect humanity. Spirit was alive. He had mind, soul, volition, heart, divine nature. That's what anim all of this animates. It's a part of the immaterial nature of Jesus Christ. This is what we're to put on. This is a part of the new man. That is the mind of Christ, the volition of Christ operating function from the soul of Christ, that we function, as I said before, the soul, we relate to the world or surroundings environment, our, our, our everything in our other people. We have soul-to-soul relationships, our spirits to God. But we're to function out of the mind of Christ, the volition of Christ, the soul of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the heart of Christ. All of that's a part of the new man. So we're to put him on, just like this little guy here. Pull him off the hanger, stick him on. That's the thought here. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and stop making provision for the flesh to fulfill its list. Now, I, I want to make, I, I knew I lost part of my stuff, stayed part of it, didn't. I want to point out to you the word but, but, or some texts say instead of, and some say rather, sorry, I lost that slide with it, but, but put on rather. Now, this tells me immediately something I need to do that's going to be a part of this, putting on, but that is cast off the works of darkness in verse 12 that we just looked at. Now, stop living as those who are dead in trespasses and sins, in which times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the sons of disobedience, it would be unbelievers, among whom also we all had our manner of life in times past, in the lust, notice where they come from, the lust, the desires of the flesh, the sin nature, the old man, fulfilling, fulfilling is the word poieo, present tense form, this is a participle, present tense, always doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, that is the mind of the old man. That's how we lived. 
And that's what we're to put off. Put off this old man, but don't walk around naked. Put on the new man. That is the new man who is created in the image of Jesus Christ. Well, here I did have him. But instead, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, I popped this up here for a reason. I'm going to have to really move. Uh, because I was questioned, I've taught some of this before, I've been questioned, but well, wait a minute. You're saying that, that Romans tells me I have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The answer is absolutely yes, I am. And then the question was, well, what about Galatians? I, I thought we have done that. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Okay, this is the word in duo, the very same word that's used in Romans 13, 14. This word is an in indicative mood here. That means from the viewpoint of the speaker, Paul, ultimately the Holy Spirit speaking. So from the viewpoint of God, the Holy Spirit, this is a reality. This, is, this, this action of putting on is looked upon as a matter of fact. And it's a consummative aorist tense, which stresses the completion of the action. So when the person says, well, I thought I put on Christ, you have, you have. In Galatians 3, 27 is talking about the positional putting on of Christ. And the positional putting on of Christ, which I picture here is being clothed in his righteousness, in the, his white righteous robe, being clothed in his righteousness, this is a single act. It happens once, it happens the moment you or I or anybody else believe the gospel. We are at that, that point permanently clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And thanks be unto God, that is how God sees you. That's how he sees me. He only sees us clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But there is something that goes beyond positional putting on. And that is what is being dealt with in Galatians 3, 27, when Paul writes here, but instead put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, or rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ in Romans 13, 14. He is now talking about the practical putting on of Christ. Romans 13, 14 refers to the practical putting on of Christ. Galatians 3, 27 refers to the positional putting on of Christ. That is a one-time thing. This is different. The practical putting on of Christ refers to putting, of, putting on of Christ for daily life in a fallen body, indwelt, by a sin nature, by the flesh, living in this present fallen world. This is what we are to do. This is what is being called for in Romans 13, 14. I want to note again something about the words put on or the words clothe yourself. In duo, the verb in this passage, in imperative mood form. This is a command. You and I have been given a direct command by God to do this, therefore, we're responsible. We are accountable for the putting on, and we have to do it. My, my wife can't put it on for me. It's not possible. You can't put it on, put it on for me. I can't put it on for you. All I can do is tell you some things about how it's put on, what it means. But you, I, every individual believer is responsible to do the putting on. So put on, clothe yourself, in do o should, because it's an aorist tense, some people, well, that's confusing. Don't you just do that once? The aorist tense, let it thaw out, if you will, please. It, it has more than one connotation. 
I talked about the one in the aorist tense is used in Galatians 3.27. That's a culminative aorist. It, the emphasis there is different. That looks at the action completed, done. Here we have something called an iterative aorist, and that's different. The iterative aorist expresses the repetition of something. It's not so much just a continual constrain, but it's a, a doing again and again and again. To illustrate it, I've tried to do this, the putting on the clothing of yourself. If you want to see some examples of iterative, and I'm going to slide by these real quick because I'm really watching time. I'm way, I can't believe it. The iterative aorist, here's an example to show you that it denotes an action that's repetitive. Give us this day our daily bread. The word give, diddle me, is an aorist tense. Well, obviously, the action of giving is going to be repetitive because it happens what? Daily. So give us our daily bread Monday, okay, then again Tuesday, and again Wednesday. Repetitive action. Uh, in fact, the repetitive nature of this giving is seen when we look at Luke's gospel, the, se the, the same uh, concept, but it's used in a, and so that we don't get confused, so we know for sure that's an iterative aorist in Matthew, Luke uses a present tense. Give us this day, give us, notice again, it's going to be day by day, our daily bread. Now give, a, give did always a present tense. So it's, this is something that is to be done on an ongoing, repetitive basis. And that's why the aorist tense is used in Romans. One last one, and then I'm going to move on from these. It says, wherefore, that field was called kalao. Kalao is an aorist tense. That field, the field where Judas hung himself, is the reference. That field is called the field of blood unto this day. Well, that's an aorist tense. Yeah, but every time somebody comes by, if you're walking, hey, what's in that field? Whose field is that? Well, that's the field of blood. And that's the two weeks later, somebody, what's that field thing? That's the field of blood. It, it, that is what it is called in a repetitive nature. And that's the sense of our word. And I'm going to pass this. I hope that wasn't too quick. Here, think of it this way. A series of little dots, okay? You put on, put on, put on, or let's picture it more clearly. On Monday, I am to put on the new man. Tuesday, go to closet. I'm to put on the new man. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and dot, 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 etc. I'm continue to put on. Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, rather clothe yourself for the Lord Jesus Christ is a daily activity for the believer. That's if we're going to keep ourselves from being deceived by the sin nature, we must day by day continue to put on the new man. Now, I ask questions. I, I, it's just my nature. When I we're talking about my doing that, practically speaking, what is it that I'm doing? How does one do that? Okay. This is just a terrific statement. And so I'm going to use it, and it will help us understand something. Going back to the word in duo, the word to put on, I said, I'll well, come back and say some more about it. Well, here's the more. In Duma, now he's looking here in the noun form, means garment, clothing, clothing in general. The verb in duo, and that's what we've been seeing, may be used for literally putting on clothing or figuratively for putting on something conceptual, clothing oneself with characteristics. That's what it means to put on Christ. We are to clothe ourselves with characteristics. I'm going to give you three, maybe it's four, but they'll be quick. There are, these are examples of the verb in duo being used with a sense of put on, but you understand that it's talking about character traits, attributes, characteristics. These come from the shepherd of 
Hermes, shepherd of Hermes, was a book that all, some people thought it in the Bible. It was a very common and well-read and well-responded to book uh, in the early church that they read. But in here, the shepherd writes, and shalt clothe thyself in duo with every excellence of righteousness. Excellence of righteousness. Righteousness is a character trait. It's a characteristic. That's what you're putting on, a character trait. It's in duo. Here's another. Now here he's talking about a guy that was just, he was an old man one in poverty. He was ready to cast in his chips. You know, he, he wanted to say, hasta la vista, adios. But somebody unloaded a pot full of money on him. That's the context. And then we read, he, this old man, rises up and full of joy, clothes himself with strength. No, he didn't go out. There's not a clothes, it's strong. He won. The strength he's talking about is a characteristic, a character trait. He put on that attribute, if you will. That's what in duo can be used for. I love this one. Therefore, clothe thyself in what? Cheerfulness. Cheerfulness, a character, a quality trait. So I hope we kind of get that sense that the word put on, the word clothe yourself with, the verb in duo, and here's from Art Gingrich's lexicon, metaphorically, very often, of the taking on of characteristics, virtues, intentions. And I would hope that would help us then to understand, and here's a pocket lexicon to the Greek New Testament. Put on, clothe yourself with, in do o, I put on, clothe another, middle voice, I clothe myself, hence metaphorically, of acquiring qualities. It's qualities. And the qualities that we are to put on, the characters we are to put on, are really those of Christ. That's what it means to put on Christ. Here's one example from the New Testament. Oh, I guess I got two. Put on, what are you putting on? Therefore, as the elect of God, this is who's putting them on, holy and beloved. Put on what? Tender mercies. That's a character trait. Kindness. That's a character trait. Humbleness of mind. That's a character trait. Meekness. That's an attribute. Long suffering. That's a characteristic. Put on character traits, attributes, characteristics, and above all these things, put on love, which, which is the bond, of, not perfect, perfectness, but is the bond of completeness. So these are all character traits, attributes. These are all things one can put on, dress himself in. Here, and how, how do we go about doing this? And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that ye put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true justice, a true holiness. The putting on happens by the renewing of the spirit of your mind, which is renewed by the teaching of the word of God. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This takes place by the word of God. How do I put on Christ and do it daily? I do that by continuing day by day to have my mind renewed by means of the teaching of the scripture. That's how we do this, putting on. And I have put on the new man, notice, that is renewed in <clears throat> knowledge. What kind of knowledge? In general, no. Knowledge after the image, that is the image of Christ, of him that created him. I'm to put on knowledge after the image, the characteristics, the traits of Christ. See, my, my mind is supposed to be coming transformed to his mind. The kind of character traits that he exhibited in life and that are clearly stated of him in the Christian, it, it, state of, of him in the scriptures, those character traits which are analogous to human beings, some are not because they are, they are divine, but those analog, analogous to human beings, all of those you and I are to put on.
putting on Christ is a deliberate, conscious choice to continue with the ongoing renewal of the mind of the new man so that the thinking of the new man will be conformed to that of Christ and will be coupled with a deliberate, determined choice to express openly Christ. Sorry, I didn't put it in there. So that our lifestyles will be permeated by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the utilizing of the means of grace, which he himself has provided for us to live by faith, that is his word, the Holy Spirit, prayer, the fellowship of other believers with a view to making manifest the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in our deeds, in words, to the glory of God our Father. Or, very simply put, and I love the way uh, Joseph XL did it, so I'm going to use this. To put on Christ is to share his might, to come, to come into quickening, electric, personal contact with him, to derive magnetic force from his personality, to live by the power of the Spirit. Now, there's a part of this I'm going to use real quick, and I love all of it, but it talks about this magnetic force. See, putting on Christ and this magnetic force, if you can see out here, yeah, the old man didn't go away, but this force field, and that's what we need, this force field that comes out from the power of Christ by the transforming by the transforming of the mind by the renewing of the mind working within the inner man that is what will keep the old man at bay he's going to be out there he's going to be trying but he will not have success if we continue putting on Christ Putting on Christ produces the fruit of the Spirit. It produces Christ-like character traits in the believer. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. These are the things that will be made manifest in our life as we're putting, as we continue to put on Christ. My final statement. Succinctly put, as Joseph Thayer said, succinctly put to put on Christ is to become so possessed of the mind of Christ as in thought, feeling, and action to resemble him, as it were, reproduce the life he lived, the life he lived as a human being. So I pray that now understanding that putting on Christ is to possess the mind of Christ, which happens by the renewal of our minds, by the renewing of the spirit through the teaching of the word of God, that you will be excited this week about getting in the Word. For as you are in the Word from it, you can receive the mind of Christ. Thank you for being with me today to have spent some time together in the Word. Didn't record a stinking thing. Died. Didn't record a stinking thing. Too bad. Yep. Hopefully it's recorded online. Okay.